Our next presentation is called Graze Anatomy, Planning Your Grazing System from the Ground Up. It's my pleasure to introduce Pam Ivanchesco. Pam is a livestock specialist with Manitoba Agriculture for over 20 years. She grew up on a mixed farm operation north of Dauphin where her family grew annual crops, perennial forages, and cattle beef. This inspired her passion in agriculture, making it her career goal. She currently resides north of Dauphin with her husband and three children. She loves the outdoors, gardening, reading when she has the time. So please help me in welcoming Pam Ivancesco. Okay, um, I think the, uh, the speakers who spoke before me led up quite a bit to what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, certainly with the whole protein strategy and increasing the herd size with heat in Manitoba um, and the fact that there is a protein demand out there, I think we have to be cognizant of how we're going to grow that protein strategy. Um, MNP alluded to the fact that land is not getting cheaper and so I think we have to learn how to utilize the land we actually have more effectively and so that uh, was the premise of sort of this project that I'm going to be talking to you about today um, with regard to utilizing a land to its maximum capacity in terms of, of forage production. Um, I, I think there is a potential in grazing management in terms of improving what we've done so far. Um, I had a co-worker who, who told me about planned grazing years ago who had been uh, rotational grazing for years prior to that and said to me, you know, I didn't realize how poorly of a job I was doing rotational grazing until I learned about planned grazing or adaptive multi paddock grazing. So I think it's important to note that this is a different way of doing things. It's a huge psychological move. Um, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift with regard to, to managing livestock on the land. Um, and one of the things that we've done with this project is basically catch up to you as producers. There's many producers who are doing this out there. There's anecdotal evidence with regard to the fact that they can improve forage and livestock production in terms of productivity and um, profitability. And so we just needed some evidence with regards to that, to be making sure that this is, this is something that is, is positive. So why planned grazing? I guess we want to maintain and improve the functions of the rangeland um, and we really want to sustain ecosystem health. This whole idea of carbon taxation is coming um, sooner than later, so we have to make sure that we are um, sort of counteracting that. We as producers want to be able to say that we are sequestering carbon and that we should get paid for it. There's a lot of ecological goods and services that I'm going to talk about in a bit in this presentation that I think we should be being paid for. You as producers are doing it. It's, it's for the benefit of society and so it's something that we need to make sure that people are noting that we're doing this and that maybe someday we can get paid for it. Um, we're looking at resilience. Uh, we've certainly seen some extreme weather um, events out there happening, and they may get worse, they may get better, who knows? But we have to make sure that the land is resilient to some of those extremes. And in doing some of this uh, proper management, we, we will be able to be resilient. Um, looking at soil organic matter, we know that when um, our ancestors came to this land, we had an abundance of good soil um, and through a lot of manipulation, through human intervention, we've destroyed some of that and maybe look at ways that we can rebuild that and increase our soil organic matter, maybe even back to the levels it used to be at. Soil, solar energy capture, something that we need to really take advantage of because it's something we can do for free. So maintaining or improving the amount of solar energy that we are capturing on the land through the process of photosynthesis, through the utilization of the forages that we are growing is something that we really have to be cognizant of. Water infiltration, capturing every raindrop where it falls, rather than um, then having soil erosion, make sure that that water is not working against us, but working for us. Taking advantage of nutrient cycling. I think it's really important to note, I'm becoming a strong advocate for the fact that we need livestock on the land. 
Our ancestors knew what they were doing in my mind when they had those small mixed farming operations. They had the chickens and the pigs and the ducks and the geese and the cows and the goats and the sheep and whatever else they may have had, being able to recycle the nutrients for them. They maybe not have understood the premise behind it and the, the physiology and the biology, but, but it was working for them and they were um, recycling nutrients to their advantage. And of course, the number one reason we need to do this is for profitability. We really have to make sure that we are penciling in every cost and every acre that we have is making us money. And so it's really important to make sure that we're doing that. And last but not least, how many people have worked cattle with a spouse or a loved one and ended up walking away um, in a very mean state? Um, I think it's important that we um, understand cattle movement and that we can train cattle to do what we want for what we want them to do for us. Um, so it's it's um, also important to make sure that what we are doing is what we are we love to do. So here, I hope I can get this to work. Nope. Here is a clip of a, a summer student took this past summer of a, our cows moving through one of the paddocks. We move the cattle every day, um, uh, usually uh, around lunch hour, and um, basically she just lifted the wire and, and uh, the cattle moved on to the next paddock. So just making sure that um, you know that this is an easy process once the cattle are trained again. It's more of a paradigm shift for the human being than it is for the cattle. So it's, it's something that's easy to do and I just wanted to uh, account for that through this video um, as to how long it took us to move cows every morning um, during this project. Okay, the ecological goods and services. Services that we are providing for free. Biological nitrogen fixation and nutrient cycling, as I mentioned early, earlier, and carbon sequestration and greenhouse mitigation. There's lots of studies that are coming out there now with regards to the fact that if we have better forages, better feed sources for our animals, for our ruminant livestock, that we are able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through their belching and, and biological processes. So we aren't contributing as much as people think we are with regards to um, increasing greenhouse gases. Um, we are capturing water when we have good um, good growth patterns or, or good production on our perennial pastures, we are certainly capturing water because we're, we're not, that water isn't um, eroding the soil into the, the riverbeds and the, and the lakes. Um, shade, windbreaks, habitat for pollinators and, and uh, wildlife, certainly that's something we're seeing as a trend um, with regards to our, our pasture plan at the Brookdale Farm and that's that we're seeing a lot more wildlife, um, including some of things like salamanders and garter snakes and, and things like that. So it's certainly something that, you know, maybe the human population will value more someday. Um, and certainly the aesthetic or the, the human personal use side of things, um, it's going to be somewhere where people from some of these urban centers may want to go someday to be able to enjoy nature. It's a, co it's a component that often gets disregarded, but maybe someday we will get paid for that. So again, why are we doing this? Um, there's a lot of, of talk about, about the carbon taxation system, and we know that back in the day, um, our, when our, our ancestors came here, that we had lots of, of carbon in the soil. We had lots of organic matter in the soil. And basically, um, we were doing a lot of that nutrient cycling, as I mentioned, with some of the livestock that they had on the land at the time. Conventional grazing, tillage practices, um, we've all kind of basically stepped back into what a functioning ecosystem was. And so what happened was a rapid degradation of a lot of that organic matter. Um, 
And because of a lack of rest and recovery on those pastures, poor management, it's not the animal's fault, it was the human intervention once again. So there was a lack of free-ranging herbivores. Back in the day, the bison grazed heavily and moved on and never came back to that land. When we put up fences, we, limit, we limited the, the, the ability for them to, to be able to choose where they wanted to graze. Um, and so basically what has happened um, with poor grazing management is that the animals um, have the, the restricted movement, they eat their preferred plants within that area of movement, and so then you get a uh, overgrazing occurring. So basically what happens is they have preferential grazing on their favorite plants and they continue to graze that plant until it basically dies because it ha doesn't have the ability to recover. So basically, um, through planned grazing, we're trying to um, eliminate that whole process of overgrazing and preferential grazing and, and try to get back to mimicking what Mother Nature had intended where the, where the bison had roamed and what they had done in terms of their grazing management. In a true native system, what we see is a lot of diversity. We moved away from a lot of that when we started um, seeding tame pastures. And so we would put one or two, or maybe even three or four, if we were lucky, different species within a mixture. But certainly we know now that with diversity on top, we see a lot of diversity on the bottom. We see a lot of different soil, um, or a lot of different root systems. That allows for a lot of different microorganisms to grow within those soils. Um, so certainly what we see on top is something that we don't see on the bottom, but that we now know exists on the bottom. And so when we look at um, our pasture species, we know that we would like more diversity to be more stable. It, it just helps with a healthier ecosystem. It helps with better water infiltration. It helps with more access for the microorganisms to move around within that system. So the carbon cycle, something that I think every producer, if they don't know about how it works, should try to understand how it works, at least the basics of the carbon cycle with regards to the whole process of the fact that um, trees and plants go through a process called photosynthesis that utilize that carbon dioxide to produce oxygen. Um, with regard to the movement of that carbon through the leaves and through the living plant and into the roots and into the soil where the microorganisms can use it is something that's very important in terms of managing the stand of the plants and, the, and trees and shrubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and simply put, there's basically three, three times that the carbon stays in the soil for days, decades, or centuries. And so when we're talking about fossil fuel usage, those, that's the century-old carbon. Um, days, that's the carbon that's recycled by the microorganisms that are in there. And then um, basically, we, just, we wanna be able to try to capture as much of that carbon and keep it back in the soil as long as we can. So basically, um, we want to make sure that we're, we're um, promoting the use of, of perennial forages, of trees, um, and, and natural habitat as it existed before. In terms of the soil food web, again, we know that there's di diversity brings a lot more than we can understand, and I'm certainly not a soil scientist by any means, but I think as producers of, of beef and, and uh, ruminant animals, we need to understand that there's a whole world below the soil that is very, very important to our um, way of life, and that if we don't interact with it in a positive manner, it's not going to be able to help us make a living and increase our profitability on our operations. So if nothing else, go talk to a soil scientist or YouTube these videos that are out there with regards to understanding soil microbiology because it plays a very, very important part of how we make our living. Right now, I think for the most part, or what, from what I can see driving through the province, we have a very disturbed ecosystem under the ground because of mismanagement of, of um, pasture systems. I see a lot of overgrazed pastures, and I specifically saw a lot this fall. Um, we, we now know what happens in a drought situation. We can leave those cows out there for a long, long period of time, um, but it's not doing our pastures any favors. And so 
Typically what happens when we have a shortage of feed is that we keep those cows out there a lot longer than, than we should, which um, basically is a, is a revolving door in terms of, of reducing that potential for profitability. Um, in terms of the soil microorganisms, um, there's a lot of them out under, under the ground, everything from bacteria to fungi to nematodes. Um, those are the, those are the, the uh, microbes that are beneficial to us in terms of being able to recycle that carbon and take that carbon out and have a symbiotic relationship with a lot of the plants. And so the healthier the plants, the bigger the root systems, the happier the microorganisms are in terms of returning nutrients to the plant and making those plants more nutritious for our animals, thus making the animals more nutritious for us in terms of a meat product. So again, it's very important. This is a very simplistic way of explaining it, um, but it's, it's a very important component of how we make our living. Um, there's a really good video that I came across um, a year or so ago uh, by Doug Weatherby who, who kind of explains in a very simple way as to why the soil microorganisms can save the planet. And I think in terms of the whole carbon sequestration thing and this carbon taxation thing, I think if we had a lot more people being able to understand the basics of carbon sequestration and the ability of plants to do that for us, the answer is at our fingertips in terms of being able to um, collectively look at um, Mother Nature as our answer to being able to sequester carbon and not having to worry about carbon in the, in the atmosphere as much as we have to at the moment. Um, you look at some of these big plants and what they're trying to do in terms of taking carbon dioxide out of the air, we have the answer in trees and, and perennial plants and, and annual plants. They do that for us. So I just can't understand why we're not looking at that as a possible solution. Um, what I see is we're, we're taking down a lot of, of shelter belts that were, were put up in the 70s and the 80s and early 90s that have the ability to sequester carbon for us um, because they're in the way of our tillage practices, which are also destroying a lot of the carbon um, that's sequestered in the soil. Um, so as livestock producers, I commend you for what you're doing in terms of keeping those perennial pastures intact, but I think we need to have a better way of doing it. Um, again, the, the whole process of having shelter belts destroyed. I found this on social media a couple of days ago and I, I just thought that it was, it's really, um, you know, such a simplistic way of looking at things and sometimes we go well beyond what we need to, to look at answers um, where they should be. So, back to the project. Um, I guess that was one of the reasons as to why to do it, but also because of the fact that um, land is not getting cheaper. MNP uh, had announced that. And so I'm looking at ways as to how we can improve our production on the land that we have. How can we increase our herd size with what we've got? Typically, our, our thoughts were, okay, let's go and buy some more land. We can put in another quarter of pasture. That's not feasible anymore. So we need to look at ways of doing things differently to be able to, to, do, to increase our herd size, keep it sustainable, um, and yet hold on to it for the next generation to be able to produce, to produce livestock as we have. This study was basically mimicking that work of Dr. Teague down in the Texas A&M um, and where they looked at uh, a number of different operations um, over a period of nine years. And basically what they did is they compared conventional uh, continuous grazing to adaptive multi-paddock or, or planned grazing is what we're calling it here. And it, over the nine years, basically what they saw, this was the increase over the nine years on those different operations throughout Texas in terms of the animal unit days per acre um, because of the management style. And so that's what we try to, to focus on here. So basically we're looking at um, showcasing planned grazing as a preferred grazing method over continuous grazing. Um, and we're, we're looking at measuring the forage production or the forage yield of the planned grazing and the potential impact on livestock production. So seeing if there's any differences in animal gains um, and also animal days per acre. Um, we also were looking at some of the biodiversity and whether that's changing through succession um, over, the, over the period of the grazing um, 
over the, the grazing project and uh, looking at the soil nutrient status and seeing if that is changing as well. The one thing that we've found is that three years probably isn't enough to make some substantial claims. We're seeing some trends, but we're certainly not, I, I can't stand up here and tell you today that we've seen significant differences yet. Um, and so we're looking at hoping to get some more funding. It's just in the process now is, is to see if we can continue with this project for another three years so that we have six years of data. Um, but. But basically, this is what we're looking at and seeing if there are um, differences between the two, two grazing systems. Additional research has been ongoing. Um, I've been uh, um, very happy to work with Dr. Terence McGonigal as well. He's a soil scientist at Brandon University. And basically, what he was looking at is the soil uh, microbial biomass changes. And so he was looking at the microorganisms within the soil and measuring their carbon output to see if there was any differences in terms of the number of carbon, um, the, number, the number of microorganisms within the, the systems, and whether they were different or not, and whether they were producing more carbon or not. Um, and I'm also looking at measuring the carbon sequestration. So we've got some test sites out at the farm um, on both of the systems. And uh, again, three years is not enough to see if there's any soil, um, soil carbon being sequestered. Um, so we're hoping that we can get three more years of funding to be able to, to measure if there was any differences in carbon sequestration between the two grazing systems as well. And, um, but we did put those in with the hopes that we would get funding because if you don't put them in in year one, then you're, you're um, not being able to look at the differences between year one and year six. So basically what we've done is we have 25 cow-calf pairs on each of the grazing systems. We have nine, approximately 90 acres on each of the systems. Um, so 25 cow-calf pairs were placed on a continuous system where they had access to the entire pasture for the entire grazing period and 25 cow-calf pairs were placed on the plan system where their grazing patterns were manipulated through grazing management, i.e. moving fences on a daily basis um, throughout the grazing season. So this is our grazing, um, these are our grazing paddocks at, at the north end. What you'll see in the light green areas is where the planned grazing systems are, and in the red is the continuous, so the cows have access through all of the system, through the 90 acres, is all in red here. So they can go throughout this whole, these two quarters, the top half of the two quarters, um, throughout, the, throughout the grazing season. Our grazing season typically lasts from May until the beginning of October, pending the environmental conditions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but within those planned grazing systems, what we see, um, they're about four acres a piece in each of the paddocks, and throughout the years we've made them smaller and smaller, so last year they were on an acre a day, the 25 cow-calf pairs, and we would move them each day every morning, as you saw in the video, um, so that they would move on to the next paddock. The whole premise behind this this um, grazing, that the planned grazing is rest. And so what we're trying to do here is that when a paddock, a paddock, meaning our one acre piece now, is grazed, that the animals will not go back there until it's had 75 days of rest. So the forage, the perennial forages within that paddock will not be grazed for a period of 75 days um, before the cattle will be able to go back there. So what we've done is taken our 22 our 22 paddocks within the planned grazing systems and made them into um, one acre pieces throughout all of these light green areas. What I also wanted to mention here was that the um, uh, project design also allowed for comparison of sort of an apple to apple scenario where um, each of these are broken into um, A to G lettering sequences. And so what happens there is that all of the A paddocks within the planned grazing system have the same or started off with the same species composition as the A paddock in the continuous system. And they are relatively the same in terms of acres as well. And so, for example, these A paddocks here are about 16 acres, and this A paddock here is 16 acres. This is the continuous side, and this is the planned side. Um, so that was all seeded with tame species um, back before we started this, this um, uh, 
experiment. And um, throughout the grazing system, there's numerous species throughout these grazing systems. And so we were trying to make sure that when we were taking samples that we were ensuring that they had the same species within each of the two grazing systems. Um, the other thing was that we put in a watering system, and so we have an above-ground pipe, um, which is um, solar-powered watering from a big slough at the north end, um, right about there. So the blue, the light blue lines are where all the solar or all the pipe is, and um, the continuous cows have access to two watering troughs, one on the west. Uh, one on the east side and one on the west side. We had only started off with one, but what we were finding is, of course, the cattle have the preference to stay around the water, and so we weren't getting good grazing utilization across the whole continuous system, so we put up another one on the, on the west side just so that they could um, have access to all of the pastures, and that seemed to help with regards to movement of the cattle on the continuous side. So in terms of results, what had happened, um, basically what we found just through, just through uh, manipulation of the cattle in their grazing um, regimes, and that is moving the cattle on a regular basis in the planned system, in 2016 we had an additional 17 days. And in saying that, I've been very um, careful in terms of my grazing management on the continuous side where I think in a real life scenario, as I saw last fall, um, cows on continuous pastures would be out there a lot longer. We have to deal with an animal care committee because we're a research-based facility, and so we cannot allow the animals to be out there in a situation where we would consider them to be starving because people are looking at the research farm. And so we generally have taken the continuous cows off a lot earlier than a normal situation. So just bear that in mind when you're looking at this data. I've been pretty um, lenient with regards to, to keeping the cows um, on the continuous pasture probably for a shorter period than normal. But anyway, um, we did get 17 additional days in 2016. We started a lot earlier in 2017. Um, we had adequate moisture and that allowed us to get those cows out there earlier on the planned herd. And then we had them for an additional 10 days, I think, later on in the fall. So we gained an extra 38 days in year two. And last year, we had extremely dry conditions at Brookdale. It was, I think, the second area uh, in terms of dry conditions, the second most dry area in the province um, in terms of having dry conditions within the whole province of Manitoba. And so um, we got an additional 10 days, I believe, of grazing last fall. Um, and we did have to take them off a lot earlier than planned. We had anticipated keeping them there until October, and they came off at the end of August. Um, again, the planned herd uh, receives water as they move into the paddocks. Uh, we have what is called a spigot system, so you just drill a hole into the pipe and place a spigot in there, and then we have a portable watering trough that we just hook up every day as we move. So we generally try to have the paddock that they're moving into ready prior to them moving the next day. So every second or every third day, the students will have the next paddock ready. So basically all they have to do is lift the fence. Um, and then when they get into the third paddock, they do the whole scenario in terms of, of uh, moving them again. The other thing we do is take forage clippings prior to moving so that we know where we're at with regard to the forage productivity and that we're matching the amount of forage within that paddock to the amount of animals and what their daily requirements are. So we have to ensure, we do a lot of extras that you as a, as a producer wouldn't do um, and the, the students are still getting it done within an, about an hour and a half in terms of the amount of workload that's there. Um, also, please account for the fact that because of animal safety, we have to make sure that we have two students there at all times, whereas probably on your operation, you would be doing it on your own. So this is just a, basically a, a very simple graph of the precipitation that we received. As you can see, in 2016, we had a phenomenal year in terms of um, of precipitation, and then last year we had a very, very dry year, which was pretty indicative of, of how we had to manage our pastures, and the grazing plan had to change dramatically over the grazing season based on the forage productivity. 
So in year one, we had 524 millimeters of rain, and last year it went down to 215, so significantly different in terms of the amount of precipitation. However, we still are seeing the fact that we are getting a lot more dry matter from the planned grazing than the continuous grazing, and this is over the entire grazing season. Um, so as I said before, we're taking quarter meter square clippings um, off of each of the paddocks before the cows move in so that we can get a, a feel for how much forage is, is there. Um, and we're taking that and accumulating that over the entire year uh, or the entire grazing season. And this is what is happening in terms of productivity for our, our uh, pastures. In year one, what we had to actually do, because of the amount of precipitation, the cows couldn't keep up, so we actually had to hay one of the paddocks in the planned grazing system um, because we wanted to keep the forage in a vegetative state and it was getting ahead of us. So with the precipitation, I think we would see even better responses than what we're seeing at the moment. Um, but certainly, um, it's very positive with regard to the amount of, of forage produced. These are our results over the three years in terms of actual pounds per acre. Um, just a couple of things here to note um, on, whoops, on this uh, particular paddock, which is the D paddock. It's in the far north and it's in a very low-lying area. Um, this is where you can see the true colors of cattle with regard to the fact that they pick and choose what they want to eat. This is a lot of bull rushes and cattails, and the cows will basically just walk right over them and uh, move on to the rest of the pasture. And so it's a little deceiving when you look at this because we as humans just, you know, we... Uh, we randomly collect samples, and so we're not like the cows where we preferentially pick where we're going to measure the, the forage productivity. So it, within those numbers, we see them climbing because of the fact that um, the cows are not eating in that particular area on the continuous graze system. Um, also to note here is in the G paddocks at the bottom, um, what we saw... Um, in year one was a lot of beautiful Sicer milk veg pastures. Um, the Sicer was taking over the pastures. And in terms of on the continuous side, we saw that they were basically equal in terms of productivity in year one. And because of the preferential grazing in the continuous systems, you can see how it's decreasing. And, and in year three, you know, we're down to a lot of... of uh, nothing really. There's a lot of Kentucky bluegrass. And we do take residual uh, measurements at the end of the grazing season just to see what's there, what they've left behind. And in some of the scenarios, we actually saw nothing. We could not collect anything on the continuous side um, in terms of, of forages that were left there. Um, our cows also have GPS collars, and so we can monitor where they're spending their time. The red areas that are circled are the continuous pastures, and so you can see the, the more intense red is where the cows tend to see a, uh, spend a lot more time. So I found this really, really interesting because the cows... As, I looked, as, you, as you looked at, this, at these results on the G paddocks, these are the G paddocks. So guess where they're spending all of their time munching on the best stuff that they're actually killing because they're grazing it way too soon prior to it being able to recover. And then this here was the A and B paddocks, or the B paddocks, where it's tame species, alfalfa, timothy, orchard grass, and they're basically killing that out as well. And so it's interesting to, to note um, these are numerous um, data points that have been collected over the grazing season. And with regard to the planned grazing, you can see these light green areas. Those are the planned cows where they spend very little time on the planned side of things. So that's because we're manipulating where they're spending their time, and so we don't see that intensity um, there. This is... Um, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So this is some of the data that we took in the first year when we had the adequate moisture. Um, and this was in October when I started taking the first residual um, uh, measurements. And you can see just in those B, this was the B paddocks, yeah. And so uh, fence line contrast, th this is 
on the, the continuous side, and this is what we left behind on the planned side. And those planned cows still spent an extra 17 days out there. So just the fact that those animals had the ability to select whatever they wanted to, um, rather than being able to let those plants rest and recover. Again, another contrasting picture. This was in the spring of 2017. We went in early June just to see how ready the pastures were. Um, and this, again, is just on the other side of the fence. So that whole saying about the grass is green on the other side of the fence, it can be if the management is correct. Um, and so you can see here, uh, just uh, to use the, the um, gator as a reference, is with regard to the amount of forage available on the same day on the other side of the fence. In terms of species composition, I want to thank Dr. McGonigal for doing his work with regard to some statistical analysis. Um, we're also doing it from a visual uh, perspective as well, but we do have some stats with regards to the changes in the species. Um, we're certainly seeing a lot of the legume species um, dying out of the continuous side of things. Um, we're seeing a lot more invasive species moving into the continuous side, so things like absinthe, dandelion, um, a lot of weedy species. Um, they're taking advantage of the fact that the, the tame species that were there or the more productive species that were there to begin in the beginning of the project, um, they're dying out. We have a lot more uh, bare ground and so those invasive species are taking advantage of that and they're coming in like wildfire. Um, one of the things that we now have is a lot of absinthe in one of the paddocks in particular, and we're calling it the absinthe pasture. So all of the students and all of the staff there know what we're talking about when we call it the absinthe paddock because of the fact that um, it, is, it is just uh, um, rampant with, with absinthe now. So one of the things that we are seeing, um, again, this is that absinthe pasture that I was talking about. This was early in the year this spring. Um, and so we're seeing things, trends. So we're seeing a lot more absinthe and dandelion, bare ground. Um, and also one of the things that we did was measure if there was any existing alfalfa that was there, we measured it as well. So in, in the continuous side, what we saw was that it was eight inches tall. And on the, on the uh, planned side, it was 13 inches tall on the same day. And this was several different measurements and an average of them. Um, and so just the growth uh, patterns of, of the forages are changing as well, um, just because we're putting up one wire electric fence. In terms of species composition, again, uh, we have a little bit of st stats that, we've, that were run. We're seeing a lot more metal brome grass actually in the continuous side. And what we're thinking there is that because of the fact that we're letting the, um, the plant herd go out earlier, the metal brome is more prone to grazing pressure when we graze it earlier. And so we're actually maybe not doing ourselves a favor in terms of turning the animals out um, on the planned pasture earlier because we are seeing more metal brome in the continuous, but we're also seeing a lot more invasive species on the continuous side. So maybe metal brome grass is not something that we may look at as a, as a potential forage for um, this type of a grazing system, but it's something to take note of because it is statistically different. Um, the whole backbone or the whole premise of this grazing project um, what I'm using is the Holistic Management International grazing plan. And so basically what it is is an Excel spreadsheet. Each one of these cells is a day within the grazing um, regime over the grazing period. So um, in year one, I'm also learning how to do this effectively as well. And one of the things that I'm learning is that um, you certainly don't use a calendar when you're grazing your animals. You need to look at the pastures and how they are um, growing and maybe move those animals to a certain paddock that's not as convenient for you to move the animals to, but certainly is more convenient in terms of forage productivity. And so in year two, what I had was more of an EKG. And so those animals were moving from different paddocks from one end of the pasture to the other based on the forage production, not based on the fact that it was convenient for the summer students to move them from paddock one to paddock two to paddock three, et cetera. Um, so through this program, basically what it does is it calculates our animal days per acre. If we're going up 
in terms of the animal days, we know that we're doing an effective job. Uh, 2018 really kibashed our, our experiment because of the dry conditions and we're kind of working against Mother Nature with regard to the fact that it was so dry and droughty. Um, and so we significantly went down in terms of days. However, we still have the productivity, we still have um, forage residue there, so I know we're doing a good job, we just have to, and this is where the importance of making sure that when you're doing a grazing project, you do it over a number of years, because there's a lot of environmental factors that come into effect that you have, that may not be there in year one or year two, but certainly we've seen it in year three. So we're hoping that we can spread this project over a number of years so that we can identify the data and be confident in what we're going to be telling you uh, with regards to the results. So profitability is the last point I wanted to touch on with regards to the economics. And I just did really simple cowboy math because I am not a mathematician and my kids will tell you that. However, basically what we did is we basically just, to make it in, in terms of a, an equal comparison, we just took the extra days grazing and put a, a number on that. And basically putting those cows into a feedlot scenario if we had to take them off of a perennial pasture. And so basically we had those um, uh, 65 extra days of grazing over the three years. And if we put them into a feedlot with regards to the amount it costs to feed that cow, $1.73, we're using Manitoba agriculture average values, $1.73 per head um, plus the yardage, which is up to $3.08 per head per day it was a savings of $5,005 for, for those 25 cows, those cow-calf pairs. So um, we're looking at the fact that we're saving ourselves $5,000 over three years just because we have additional days grazing and we don't have to feed them. In terms of the additional resources that we had to use, we had to put the watering system in for both, so we really didn't account for that as an additional cost. The only real thing that we have was additional fencing um, in terms of reels and pigtail posts um, and labor. And so we're looking at, at those as additional costs for the, the um, planned grazing. In terms of labor, again, we had to have two students at all times out there every day. Um, it doubled in, up in terms of our labor with regards to the planned grazing. Um, and so. Uh, with regard to the fact that we had the additional fencing, so we had bought three extra reels. We put up three, basically enough to have three miles of fence and the additional pigtail posts. That total cost was about $607.50. And then um, we accounted labor to be about $15 per hour. And I basically had dumbed it down to one person because one person could easily do this. Um, so that was a total of $2,300. So I added those two up and um, subtracted it from that $5,005, and we were still ahead. Um, over the three years in the 25 cow-calf pairs, we made $2,795 per cow. So we were still up in terms of um, a positive margin with regards to making a profit just by some additional fencing every day um, in terms of putting up a one strand electric wire and, um, and uh, pigtail posts. So in terms of observations and conclusions, um, we have to manipulate where the cattle go. We had lots of residue left where the cows had a choice as to palatability, that kind of thing. We put in some drilling mats in low areas so that cows could have more flexibility in terms of movement. They didn't want to walk through low areas and um, things like that. So one of the things we're noticing is that we are having less medical issues with the planned cow herd. Um, last year, we had one open cow in the continuous side. We didn't have any in the planned side. Um, so just small things like that. We're seeing a lot more pocket gophers moving into the continuous side. It's easier that for them to burrow through um, places where there's no roots. Um, and so we have a lot of, of observations that hopefully we can have make good, strong conclusions um, in another three years. Again, food for thought. We haven't put a value on the fact that we're sequestering more carbon um, and our impact on the environment. We're seeing a lot more of these out there, which is kind of scary when you're doing forage sampling and they slither in. Um, but the, the whole idea of regenerating the land back to, to what it was. Um, and I just want to close off with 
some of the published data that Dr. Teague has done over his number of years of sampling uh, or of experiments throughout Texas and the U.S. Um, and look at the carbon that he is, um, that, that's been published in terms of the amount of, of carbon that's been sequestered in a lot of those farming operations throughout the U.S. So we know there's a possibility of doing it and that maybe it's something that, that we really need to move forward on um, in terms of the environmental sustainability within our farming operations here. And I think that's it. Keep moving. So, Pam, are you going to be around for questions? Just a short period of short time. Short period of time. She'll be up at the top if you have any questions for her. Uh, let's thank Pam Ivancesco for her presentation.